Thank you so much, and, um, and uh, I'm so glad to see that everybody uh, survived the, the excellent dinner last night. Um, when, uh, when I first um, I was approached uh, to moderate this panel and, and I saw the words um, Indo-Pacific um, in the theme, then, uh, then immediately uh, uh, China came up to my mind. We've been talking a lot about uh, Ukraine uh, during this, uh, this conference, and, and rightly so. But at the same time, we're seeing uh, quite many developments happening um, in the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, area. Uh, we, see, we get news about China doing kind of this island hopping, trying to get new uh, defense agreements with, uh, with different countries. And uh, the, the big question, for me is, are we missing something? What, what is the role of, of cyber in, in this domain? As, as we know also China um, having been uh, quite active in, in, uh, in cyber. So to talk about this and, and some other aspects of, of, uh, of, that, of this area, I have a fascinating panel here. Um, and first of all, thanks for the organizers. It's a gender balanced uh, panel, so uh, so kudos for this. Um, I will start uh, from uh, from what we internally agreed uh, uh, as a speaking order. Uh, first, uh, Ambassador uh, um, Arima from uh, from Japan, uh, Ambassador for uh, for uh, Cyber Policy. Um, then, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of uh, from. Uh, Department of uh, Defense from the U.S., uh, Mika Young, and uh, representing more free speech in cyber, <laughs> um, uh, Carly Winkler uh, from uh, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Um, so we, we do have kind of the, the government views here and, and non-government views, but um, uh, Yutaka, um, what, what is your take on, on what is happening in, in your neighborhood right now? Uh, Tanel, uh, thank you very much, uh, and thank you uh, for having me here. I'm uh, extremely honored uh, to be a panelist uh, amongst uh, distinguished colleagues. Um, I guess before I go into our part of the world or our region, um, what is happening in Ukraine uh, has shocked uh, everyone around the world uh, and people around uh, in Japan uh, and in our neighborhood are shocked as well. Um, the existing international order based on the rule of law is being challenged uh, and uh, the international community must stand up to it. Uh, anyone who is seeing this, any country who is seeing the situation in Ukraine must come to understand that uh, the use of force uh, to change the status quo or to uh, use by, uh, uh, military means in violation of internal law uh, will not be tolerated. Uh, and will have consequences. Uh, China uh, is, uh, have become an economic power, a strong power, a military power as well. Uh, and the security situation in our part of the world has become very difficult. Uh, we feel, uh, not we feel, I mean, I think cyber uh, is a realm that reflects geopolitical tensions uh, in our part, of, uh, in, in any part of the world. Uh, and uh, China, on its own, uh, is uh, uh, carrying out activities that are of concern to us. Uh, President Biden recently made a visit to Tokyo uh, in the uh, joint uh, statement between our prime minister and the president. Uh, we expressed concern for many of their activities. Um, and what is also of concern to us is that uh, China and Russia are they had been close, but they may be even getting closer. Uh, President Putin visited uh, Beijing uh, in February, uh, right before the Beijing Winter Olympic Games. Uh, their joint statement uh, said uh, their uh, friendship has no limits uh, and there are no forbidden areas of cooperation. Um, they have on the 24th of May, on the day that the Quad leaders, leaders of Japan, the United States, Australia, and India were meeting in Tokyo on that specific day, uh, Russia and China jointly flew uh, bombers uh, in areas around Japan. They had only started to do this in 2019, but this was the fourth time that they had carried this out. Uh, so you can understand the geopolitical tension uh, that is uh, surrounding 
uh, Japan uh, and uh, the cyber realm uh, is where we uh, see increasingly uh, activities uh, that reflect this. Um, both uh, NATO and Japan-US alliance recognize uh, that uh, cyber attacks could constitute an armed attack, uh, but uh, activities that we see today are <coughs> below that threshold. But it is more challenging to, uh, to deal with these, uh, uh, these uh, malicious cyber activities um, and it's, it's becoming more challenging for Japan. I don't want to go on for too long, so I'd like to pass the baton over to uh, Domika. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I really appreciate the question, Tanel. It, I think it's a very important one, and one that we're wrestling with uh, all the time in the Department of Defense. Uh, our new national defense strategy recognizes that China is the pacing threat, and while Russia and the conflict in Ukraine is the acute threat and um, is, as I think many have acknowledged here, the first time that we are seeing uh, cyber con in conflict. Uh, there's a lot for us to be learning about what this means. But at a strategic level, the key takeaways from the <clears throat> conflict between Russia and Ukraine is that it is not just a regional conflict. It is not just of interest to, the, to NATO and the countries in Europe. It is of interest to countries all over the world. And we have seen countries from all over the world recognize that the attempts to deprive Ukraine of its sovereignty is something that all of us oppose. And so we appreciate the aid provided by Japan, by Australia, by others all around the world on the other side of the planet. This also has tremendous implications for potential conflict in the Indo-Pacific. If someone attempts to change the existing status quo and self-governance by force, I think we have been very clear that that is something that is unacceptable. And that, like in Ukraine, countries will pay a very high price for doing that, and, it will, um, and there will be a need to be held accountable for any such attempt. But as we look at this current crisis, we are learning many lessons about how we need to prepare, especially in the cyber domain, to ensure that countries are able to preserve their self-governance in cyber and in conflict. Carly. So I think the only, the only useful thing I can add to that, because my colleagues have expressed it so well, um, is how the Indo-Pacific region um, is, is a slightly different problem from a, from a cyber domain perspective. And that is because of a lot of the you know, um, cutting edge technology development, um, much of it is happening in the Indo-Pacific. We have um, some very technologically advanced neighbours, uh, and of course, China is a technological powerhouse. That means that uh, in addition to you know, the traditional methods of warfare that we would expect in, in conflict, and again, no one, no one wants to see conflict in the Indo-Pacific. Um, but in addition to that, they have a lot of other levers they can pull, and it means that um, conflict can look a little different, or at least it needs to be taken in that broader context. Now, I know I'm repeating things that many others um, have said during this conference, um, but, uh, you know, cyber, cyber conflict isn't one angle uh, in, in conflict in the Indo-Pacific. Um, China... Uh, th there, is, there is no one more interested in spying on and manipulating the Chinese than the Chinese Communist Party. And that means that they are very practiced in uh, certain types of um, state monitoring. Uh, it makes them very, very competent at um, applying things like the social credit system, at applying new and advancing technologies such as facial recognition, um, technology drone-based warfare. They invest enormous amounts into advanced technologies such as AI. They have a major driver in that space to develop. Um, with managing an enormous population, uh, industrial upgrades and, and a very large military. Um, from a quantum perspective, they, uh, in 2020, they invested more money than the next uh, five, I believe, um, competitors in the quantum space. So they invested more money cumulatively than uh, Germany, France, the United States and the EU combined. Uh, that is a lot of investment in advanced technology uh, and, and what is capable when, when you are practiced and have invested a lot in that technological space is that it's not just a matter of, um, you know, cyber attacks as we are currently used to them. It is also 
um, the use of authoritarian direction on technology companies that are worldwide. And so the integration of technology that is dictated or directed by a certain government um, being implemented in critical infrastructure worldwide. Uh, and again, we've spoken about supply chains, and the need to understand what kind of technology is where, what capabilities are where, and you know, technology such as, for example, um, language translation, when you combine uh, organisations who are particularly interested in disinformation, misinformation, uh, investing in this kind of technology and then embedding it into systems and deploying that around the world where we aren't sure where it is, it means that it becomes very, very hard to manage misinformation uh, and disinformation and censorship. So the, the breadth of cyber um, campaign is quite broad um, with, when you're working with uh, highly sophisticated technology adversaries. And there is a lot at risk in the Indo-Pacific, which um, as, as we have the majority of the world's semiconductors manufactured in uh, Taiwan, in South Korea, in China, and in, in America, um, without chips we have no tech. So being able to make sure that we are protecting our neighbours, that we're protecting our, our technological freedom and how that is going to be directed, that we're protecting standards in a way that um, they adhere to, to principles that we all agree to, um, that are open, fair, transparent, um, and that adhere to international uh, rules-based orders. So there is, there is a lot at risk in the technical domain in this space, uh, and it's a, you know, again, we've spoken a lot about the Ukraine and Russia, and I, can I extend my respects to the Ukrainians here today, to everyone who has dealt with and has to live in countries that have faced Russian aggression, and to those of you who fight back, um, you know, it is humbling your bravery and engagement, and it's, again, on the other side of the world, we find it difficult to figure out what we can do in this space. Um, so please let us know. Um, again, there's additional, additional threats that I think it's worth also continuing to look at at the same time as they learn from Russia. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to cl clarify one, one aspect here. Um, and uh, Taka, you mentioned um, the, the Quad. And, and the Quad recently also had at the summit. Uh, and all of the countries also pledged uh, $50 billion uh, for the infrastructure. Are there any implications also on, on, uh, on, on the cyber or, or how, how we can, how Quad wants to defend uh, the, uh, or, or invest here? Um, Quad um, is a, 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 a framework uh, of uh, four like-minded countries that wants to promote uh, uh, international order based on the rule of law, fundamental values that we all share. Um, and we are uh, saying that we would like to promote what we call the free and open Indo-Pacific, which is international order based on the existing international, you know, where, where, we, where we are now. And we would like to do good deeds within the region and even beyond. Uh, and $50 billion uh, investment in the infrastructure project, um, the vaccines that we will be promoting, uh, the uh, cyber uh, security sphere where we would cooperate, uh, and we would cooperate to provide uh, technical assistance uh, to countries in the region. Um, we, cyber, uh, of course, is one of the areas that we would like to do good deeds within the region. Uh, $50 billion is, is more for infrastructure, but, but cyber is obviously included in the things that we would like to carry out. Yeah, I think one of the keys when we think about the Quad and cyber is all of our commitments to the free and open internet and the cyber domain. Um, I really appreciate our Lithuanian colleagues who've done deep technical analysis of Chinese products and discovered that Chinese censorship tools are hardwired into the products that they sell throughout the world. The four of the four countries are committed to a different vision of technology, a multi-stakeholder uh, free and open environment, and I think many of our European colleagues share that view. Uh, and so as we think about how to contest the increasing digital authoritarianism, I think the Quad and the conversations that we have there become increasingly important. And if I can add to that too, you know, with um, relationships like the Quad and with AUKUS and with ASEAN and, and a bunch of the other relationships that we have around the world that are, that are beyond NATO, um, 
the point of those is not to be exclusive. It's, it's to pull some threads and try things um, based on existing relationships that have worked, say, in the Five Eyes domain um, and in bilateral relationship that we've always had with Japan and with India, um, and to, to pull together different groups to try some things out based on existing trust that has been built over decades, and then to bring people in. Um, and I think that's, that's a key message that, that we need to make very clear, that it, we're not here to be exclusive. Um, we're here to enhance the addition, the, you know, and provide additional effort on top of what's already happening in the NATO community. And so we would really like, um, you know, to, to start exercising some of the issues that we have around trust, around data, around infrastructure, around people, um, and the challenges that we face, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region, around technology, around climate change, again, is a key message that's come out of the Quad because you know, a number of our neighbours, the, the drivers for them are not the same as, as they are for us, or at least you know, they're, they're struggling to survive in a world or worry about the future of their countries, their cultures, um, in a world where, you know, the island nations may be underwater in five years. Now, that aspect of survival, you know, changes the equation in terms of where their vulnerabilities might be and where their priority is going to go in terms of cyber support. So we, you know, our role in the region is not to come and protect everyone from um, big, bad outside forces. It's to help these countries protect themselves. And so the concept of um, helping vulnerable nations uh, build their own cyber capacity is really critical. Uh, if we, you know, when, when cybersecurity really is only as good as its weakest link, if we're able to smooth out that attack service regionally and give attackers nowhere to latch onto, then it reduces the noise when, if it comes to conflict, it increases trust, we have a difficult time trusting people or building trusted relationships if their networks are being owned or if they're being manipulated. So we can build trust in that space. And it allows us and buys us time to plan rather than to react when we're under pressure. So working with countries to build that cyber capacity for themselves to maintain their sovereignty, um, their ability to self-govern and, and their resilience um, in, in a cyber domain, which in a lot of cases is um, almost extraneous to their, to their driving needs at the moment to, to be competitive and to survive um, and to, to thrive in the modern world. So, um, again, the, the, the goal is really to, to try things out, to see what works, to bring people in and, and to do it in a way that, that you know, adheres to those international um, you know, rules-based law uh, and, and do it together. And still... We heard from a journal we were a couple of days ago about uh, the number of democratic countries, the number of undemocratic countries. Uh, my question here would be, are our policies working in that? From, from uh, my, my daily job, when we deal with uh, capacity building uh, projects, uh, or we're discussing, coordinating different projects, I don't see that, that uh, we are really kind of leveraging what we do in these countries. We are not leveraging the, these projects to become kind of political mind shift in these countries. So maybe I have to put you on the spot, Carly, um, what are we doing wrong then? Well, I mean, I think in, in certain cases it's about making sure that we're, we're asking questions and doing it respectfully. Um, that we, we understand, um, again, where some of these nations are coming from and what they're vulnerable to. But I also understand that um, no, one wants, <laughs> no one wants other countries to come in and dictate how things are going to go for them. And no one wants to open doors and allow in attackers to manipulate their population. Uh, and no one really wants to cede sovereignty and, and their own national resilience. I mean, neither, neither do we. Um, so I think making sure that we provide them with options and alternatives in the region. I mean, China, again, technological powerhouse, is able to go out and sell really sexy sounding solutions to a lot of these nations. Um, and, uh, and those nations, they're not stupid. They, they know what the costs are um, to, to engaging. And what we try to do is provide an alternative that, um, you know, 
protects some, some more of those values that they hold true. So I think it's about an ongoing ability to build trust and to, to also expose um, to people in our own countries, because our own people are just as vulnerable to manipulation and disinformation as, as people in other countries, um, expose and shine daylight and fresh air on um, you know, cyber attacks and, and you know, cases where we've got demonstrable manipulation, coercive diplomacy being applied, pressure, that, that does reduce people's ability to be sovereign. Um, and make sure that those cases are clear. And so if you know, these countries are able to make a conscious and educated decision about what they choose to invest in, and then it, honestly it is up to them. Um, but we, we provide an alternative that aligns with a set of rules that we need to both adhere to, be transparent about, and also walk the walk on. Any additions? <coughs> no, I, uh, not on the quad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, um, next point that, that uh, could be a, a bit more uh, sexier topic in, within, uh, within cyber and, and, and China is um, what do you think, what is, what is China right now learning from uh, Russia's cyber activities in, in Ukraine? Yeah. Uh, or the whole conflict, how, how will that kind of um, inform their policies? Yeah, uh, so <clears throat> what the Chinese are actually learning, I think um, we would have to ask them. <laughs> but I do think that there are some important lessons that they can be observing from this conflict that are very important for us to understand when it comes to fighting in the Indo-Pacific. Um, first is that it is much it is difficult to change the strategic orientation of the defender by cyber means. That if the defender is committed to its own self-governance and territorial integrity, cyber disruption does not change that strategic perspective. And that it is much harder to um, force uh, the defender to give that up, um, even with kinetic means. The other thing that they should be learning is that their estimates of how long and how difficult this conflict might be may be off. Russia very clearly thought that this would be much easier uh, to take the entirety of Ukraine than they expected. Their own analysis and their, own, their assessments of their own capabilities were off. In an authoritarian system where disagreement and bringing bad news to your leadership is something to be punished and not something uh, to be taken in as a opportunity for improvement, the chances that you are not being told accurately whether or not you are ready to fight are quite high. <clears throat> and that is a real challenge for China. Um, the other thing that I think is really important to understand, and this is a challenge for all of us, is that a history of cyber attacks prepares the defender to be resilient in the face of them. And Ukraine has been tested, and um, other countries, uh, other partners have provided assistance to their cyber defense for a very long time. Um, and how we think about shoring up the cyber defenses and improving the resilience of countries in the Indo-Pacific region is something that we need to do with alacrity. Lessons learned from this conflict about the importance of resilience, the structures that are needed to maintain insight into your national networks, to be able to remediate those things quickly, to know what help you need from the outside world. These are all very important lessons that we are learning right now. Um, but this conflict is still ongoing, so I am hesitant to say exactly what those lessons are, um, because there can be further turns in this conflict our insights into exactly what has happened in the cyber domain are still evolving as we learn more from the private sector, from the Ukrainians themselves, and even, I think, as we may learn uh, more from Russia about how restrained or unrestrained they have been in this conflict um, in the cyber domain. So I think that there's a lot that we can learn and a lot that we need to think about preparing um, in the Indo-Pacific so that countries there are also prepared to preserve uh, their sovereignty. And their territorial integrity. Um, <clears throat> I completely agree with uh, what uh, Mika just said. I mean, uh, exactly what China is learning, you really have to ask uh, the Chinese. Uh, but what we can see 
uh, from the conflict in Ukraine is what she had just talked about, especially in the cyber sphere, is cyber resiliency. I am just uh, impressed uh, at the, the, how the Ukrainians uh, are, supposed, uh, are able to maintain all the major uh, the critical infrastructure within their own territory to continue to provide uh, uh, services to their cell phones and their, their, their SNS accounts are all very active and, and it's, it's like, how are they doing this? Uh, we have one earthquake and we, we, you know, we, we have one, uh, we could have an electric power plant down, but they have a war going on uh, when they have a, a con continuous cyber attacks, which they are uh, resisting. Um, and so for the lessons we can learn for, for uh, the situation in our part of the world uh, would be to have to enhance and then continue to enhance cybersecurity uh, and to have cyber resilience. Uh, at the same time, I guess it'll be just a little bit off, uh, we come above ground. Um, we saw in the United Nations that over 140 countries uh, voted to condemn uh, Russia uh, for their uh, aggression against Ukraine. So that's uh, 140 out of 193. Uh, you may think that you know, we're missing 50. But that, that's three quarters of the countries around the world are united uh, in opposing this unilateral aggression in clear violation of international law. Uh, and the economic sanctions that we are all imposing on them, the G7 is leading that, uh, that effort. Uh, and the, the, the financial costs to uh, Russia and their economy uh, is substantial. Uh, and I think, as I said at the beginning, uh, we must make sure that any country watching or following this conflict must take away, go away with the, le uh, the lesson that this cannot be repeated or that they should not be trying this kind of an effort. So is my translation now correct, saying that the Ukrainian resilience and somewhat chaotic ac Russian activities are right now deterring also China to take further actions against Taiwan? <clears throat> To quote Joe and Lai, as we saw earlier, too soon to tell. <laughs> um, but I do think uh, any country that is thinking about changing self-governance by force, by changing the existing status quo by force, um, needs to be wary of the consequences globally for doing so. Um, and especially a country that is as intertwined in the global economy, that has so many leverage points, um, that countries could say, I am no longer interested in doing business with you. Um, I'm no longer interested in supplying you with whatever. Um, those are high prices to pay. Um, aside from the fact that it could be incredibly embarrassing for the country that is attempting uh, to take by force, um, thinking that they are the stronger power, in fact, turning out to be not as capable and demonstrating that weakness on the global stage. I mean, the, I completely agree. I think the, the fact that China will attempt to reunify Taiwan into China is not up for debate. They have been very clear about that for decades, that they believe that Taiwan is part of China. Um, I think the question is how and what we've learned from Russia is really that doing that by force is really not an option for them um, if they want to preserve peace and, and again, as, as you've said, n not embarrass themselves in the face of hundreds of countries that are going to um, argue that, that that is not an appropriate way of, of working in the region. Um, I guess one of the leverages that, that we have, and, and uh, the Chinese leadership has also um, kind of voiced it out, is that um, we have huge kind of economic ties with China, and China is, is also interested in keeping these economic ties. And we saw that that's in the debate of, um, about the sanctions uh, against Russia, and Chinese seem to be quite wary about that. Um, my next question here would be, so if we see, see or try to interpret what China is, is, is learning from the, the conflict uh, or war, Russia's war against Ukraine, what are the lessons for us how to deal with China tomorrow and day after tomorrow? Yeah, <clears throat> I think that as we think about global technology development and adoption, 
I think uh, we need to think carefully about what adoption of Chinese technology might mean. And I think that for a long time, there was a set, you know, in the 90s, sort of very optimistic deterrent through entanglement um, that we would have entwined economies and that would prevent conflict. But largely, the entanglement has gone one way. Um, we have not seen the same adoption of Chinese, of, of Western technologies within China. Um, and I think that that poses a challenge. But as we think about, and as some people I think are, um, see the appeal of adoption of Chinese technology platforms based on cost and all the rest of that. Um, it may feel cheaper in the moment, but the long-term security costs to being able to ensure that you have control over your network, that your network is not part of a censorship apparatus for another in another country's interest and not your own, I think are things that countries have to consider very carefully when, when considering that offer. Um, it does not have to be that you know there is confrontation here, but I think we have to figure out how um, we can uh, shape uh, ensure that China is playing by global rules um, that are consistent and preserve the allow countries to preserve their own self governance um, and not be coerced uh, either explicitly through economic means or implicitly through the technology they have adopted. Um, to someone else's national security interest. As I, again, I agree with what Mika just said. Uh, and also, uh, I guess in terms of what we would like uh, to do is to deter uh, action, uh, meaning not just in cyberspace, but just to deter uh, any activity by the Chinese that will, will change the status quo uh, in our part of the world, which they are in East China Sea uh, doing uh, on a daily basis uh, and then making unlawful maritime claims in the in South China Sea. Uh, they are becoming, they, they are challenging what we would call the existing international order. Uh, and I think, as Mika just said, there are risks to, uh, the, the, the economic influence of China is just global. Uh, they are the second largest economy in the world. Uh, and we are 20% of Japan's trade is with China. But we must make sure that uh, the, the important uh, infrastructure that we rely on, or be it uh, in the cyber sphere or in the physical sphere, uh, are reliable. We just enacted a new legislation on economic security uh, where uh, and if we would designate uh, certain industries as critical infrastructure industries. And if they're going to make a major procurement, they will uh, submit uh, the proposal uh, to the government. We will only review and we will only advise but make sure that they are, uh, we would make sure that they are from trusted vendors. Uh, and I think uh, one, uh, you know, th th it's, it's, it's important to maintain our uh, international order the way we live, uh, continue to enjoy the economic successes that we have had, uh, at the same time, not be too reliant uh, on, uh, on uh, products that are not reliable. Uh, and so that, that we would be at, at, the, at, the, at the mercy uh, of a certain untrusted uh, vendor. Uh. I, I would just like to add, I, we really appreciate that Japan has taken this step because as we think about capacity building with other countries and we think about increased cooperation in the cyber domain, um, whether or not a country's networks are trusted um, is a key factor in how far cybersecurity cooperation with the United States can go. If we have concerns that the networks are vulnerable, um, have been compromised, it makes it very difficult for us in the US to share sensitive or classified information uh, with another country. So this is a real challenge as countries think about these networks. Um, it, Typically, you know, when you think about your information technology networks, you don't think about the national security implications. But if someone else is able to turn off or route traffic on your networks differently than you would choose to, if they are able to um, collect in bulk the traffic on it, uh, that poses a real challenge to our ability to share, because the last thing that we want when we are trying to plan and coordinate together activities in the national security arena is to have adversaries sitting inside that communication. 
I'm, I, can I be slightly controversial at this point? Please. I don't feel like I've said anything controversial so far. I mean, we, we need to prepare <laughs> the audience also for the questions. So, uh, yes, controversial, uh, the, please. The, the not controversial part is, again, could not agree more. I think the extension to, to, um, to what we've just heard is that any conflict um, with advanced, sophisticated advanced technological powers, um, such as China or anyone else, is that it is not contained to a military versus military argument, right? This is not where the bounds of that fight is going to happen. And we can expect to see ongoing grey zone um, engagement and conflict um, as, as we are currently facing now. So it is tempting to, to look at conflict and say, de defence is going to, to handle it. And I think, you know, conflict with, um, in, in cyberspace is one of those Here's the first controversial part. Defence is uniquely not qualified to fight that on their own. We know that public-private partnerships have been really successful in Ukraine. We know that there's, there's problems with getting enough skilling and, and um, uh, staff to, to, who can work in the cyber domain. But one of the reasons that defence can't do it on its own, and this is not anything to do with their capabilities, defence is probably able to, to protect defence, if they're very, very good, they're able to protect defence and a bunch of government departments. But we also have people in our countries who are individuals and who have small businesses and who fall below the threshold of what a state can afford to, to support. And yet we owe them protection. We owe them protection. That's a little bit why they pay taxes. So uh, we, we need to be able to deal with the fact that today we are, those, those people are having their lives destroyed and their livelihoods ruined um, and are being manipulated um, by, by foreign actors. And, and our response to that probably needs to not be focused on it in a, in a narrow space. I mean, the controversial part, which I will say now, is that we tend to get wrapped around the axle a little bit about whose responsibility it is, depending on the activity. And it is arguably unhelpful to do that. So traditionally, I mean, we all have secrets. We all have intelligence communities that, that have, you know, information they protect and have sovereign interests that they will protect, and that is good and right. And we all agree to that. Um, but we get caught um, usually in a policy domain about what is coming from offshore and what is onshore and what's domestic. And of course, in cyberspace, shore is largely irrelevant. Uh, which means that the division of, of effort that we have inherited from many years working in an intelligence space um, ties us in knots. So is this, a, is this an intelligence problem? Is it a security problem? Is it a military problem? Is it a domestic security problem? Is it a law enforcement problem? And, and, and the answer is it doesn't matter. <laughs> Those groups need to be working together. Is it, a, is it a cyber security industry problem? Who cares? We have to be able to get around this issue and make sure that we're getting the right people to deal with the fact that they're all attacks um, and that we do need to protect our people as much as we need to protect the institutions that, that they have either voted in or that, that run their country. So it's a, it's a difficult space to figure out. We will always have information that we need to be able to protect. And we all have the sovereignty uh, and the need to make sure that we're all individually resilient. I think the trick is finding a way to share what we can share and going beyond sharing, because the reality is also sharing is not sufficient. <laughs> we need to actually build something that is greater than the sum of the parts, and that means we need to build something together in a collaborative way, but not in this naive collaborative way that's like we're this utopia where we're all magically going to open up and give everything that we have to everyone else, because that's not going to happen. But we can look at building systems you know, in a world where we talk about zero trust and we talk about trust but verify. We can trust our partners but verify and expose the right information that is going to provide the right context. But we need to exercise the policy and get the policy issues sorted out, both domestically and internationally, to be able to do that. It is also quite interesting, uh, as you mentioned, that the public-private partnership, and uh, I would even widen that. It's not uh, the, about partnership with, uh, with the industry, but what, what we have seen in, in Ukraine, besides the, the, the new role of, of, of big tech companies, are also these vigilante groups that are, co are completely uncontrollable. Um, and my, my last question before we go to the audience um, questions, 
is what do you think, what is China, how is China looking at, at these kind of developments? Because these are kind of new elements in, in cyber world and cyber warfare. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think the sort of call to arms for volunteers that uh, in, in the cyber domain that has happened here is a complicating factor. And it's very difficult for us to assess the overall impact of that activity um, on Russia's military capability um, and what kind of assistance that has provided to Ukraine. Um, likewise, I think we have all known for quite some time that there are a large number of non-state actors within Russia that have varying degrees of relationship with the government um, in cybercrime. And they, you know, how they are used in the Russian system, um, you know, they, they pose this sort of hybrid threat. Um, we saw in the Microsoft Hafnium incident, um, and this was part of the US attribution statement about that activity, was that uh, there was an ungoverned ecosystem in China taking advantage of that exploit, and that was actually quite problematic. Um, we had not seen typically, and we don't see the same kind of criminal actors, the sort of scope and scale that we see in Russia operating out of China, that China has announced that they um, are against cryptocurrency processing on their territory. So the availability of non-state actors in China is different. They obviously are a country that puts an emphasis on control. Um, but how they would have to deal with non-state actors if they were to try and change the status quo by force and, and take on this very aggressive, unprovoked affront to uh, the international rules-based order. Um, I think that it's something else that uh, uh, an aggressor nation would have to consider, reconsider. Um, not only the non-state actor hackers, but the non-state actor industry responses that might happen, as, you have see as we have seen in the Russia-Ukraine context, Western companies withdrawing their services from Russia uh, in response to sanction, in, as a protest to the activity itself, or in response to criminal, act, uh, criminal laws imposed by Russia against the kind of things that were core to their business model. This is another complicating factor for how a conflict with China might play out that is outside of specific government direction. Um, and so I think that these things are things that we will all study, and if they're academics here, we look forward to your analysis. Um, but I think these are important lessons for all of us to understand um, and analyze going forward. Do you want to add anything? Or? Could, I, could I make a speculation? I'll write it down, so next year we'll, uh, you we'll can see. Quote, you can quote <laughs> me on it. One of the interesting things about quantum computing is not that it's here today, although we can do a certain amount of quantum computing today. And, and the threat has always been, well, it's going to break you know, most of the public key cryptography and the cryptography we depend on for our security today. But one of the interesting things about the fact that it's coming um, is really trying to guess how far away it is. Because at some stage, it is entirely possible to harvest data now, um, hold it, and then decrypt it when the quantum computers are ready. So. If someone were to invest a lot of money in quantum computing, and if they had an appetite for stealing people's cheese, then you can probably suggest that there would be groups who would be happy to harvest data um, and sell it to the highest bidder who would be potentially thinking of that as an intelligence opportunity for the future. Hypothetically speaking. <laughs> Um, are there any hypo hypothetical questions from the audience? <laughs> uh, first here, and then I saw a hand there also. And please uh, pose your uh, question as a question. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I will try to keep it short. Um, so, Kathy, um, question to you. Very good points you made there. Jumping to solutions, what would you say are good approaches um, to reach out to China on a diplomatic level? and give them a hand to save their face and uh, yes, try to bring this conflict to an end more or less in a peaceful way because I guess they will be quite interested in that given that they are heavily investing in their Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. I'm going to defer that to people with diplomatic experience as opposed to people with technical experience about how, how we could use that path. 
Um, <clears throat> I think the, uh, for us, what is extremely important is we're not seeking confrontation. Uh, we are seeking, uh, as we often say in, in many of our declarations, uh, peace and stability uh, uh, of the uh, Taiwan Strait and that uh, the Strait issues need to be uh, resolved peacefully. Um, and we are, all, Japan and the US, both in Australia as well, we are always having dialogue, or we are seeking dialogue with China to say, we have issues that we would like to raise. We have concerns about what you're doing in East China Sea, South China Sea, your uh, economic coercion measures. These are some, but at the same time, as I said, we both have very strong economic ties with China, uh, and we want to have a constructive uh, relationship uh, and work on global issues uh, of mutual interest. Uh, we are trying to establish that kind of a relationship, but we are not, what we are trying, what we are uh, adamantly against is a, an order where the strong dictates what the weak should do, uh, or the, the, in the, uh, their sphere of influence that they get to do whatever they want to do, uh, uh, ignoring the, 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 the norms that we have, uh, the rules and the laws that we have established over over many years, uh, and so that it, we, I, I think, it is for uh, the, uh, it is as much on the part of the Chinese as it is on the part of us to be able to have that kind of a constructive relationship. I, I would just say before we can get to what we would discuss, we would have to have a commitment to a discussion, mm -hmm. and so I would encourage the Chinese to <laughs> welcome the chance to have these conversations <laughs> at all levels. We had a question here in front, President Ulvas, and then we'll go back there. Uh, thank you. The, uh, in the, basically, the rise of the digital era, regional groupings such as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization that obviously, by definition, cannot have uh, Japan or South Korea uh, or Australia in it, becomes kind of irrelevant. Tallinn, Torino, Toronto, Topeka, Tokyo, and Taipei are all the same, same distance uh, from each other or from an adversary. And APT 28 and 29 don't care about whether it's the US State Department or it's the Dutch Foreign Ministry or the Bundestag that they are hacking. Clearly in this era, we need far, far more regional cooperation between like-minded, anti-authoritarian, rule-based societies. My question is, uh, well, how much of that is there? There isn't very much. I mean, even between the United States and Europe, now that the UK has departed uh, from, the, from the European Union, uh, I mean, five eyes, Europe is out of it. And then there, is, then there are the democracies uh, on the other side of the Pacific. They too, rule-based democratic societies, um, highly technologically advanced, yet we see, uh, we don't see any kind of defensive or security-based uh, uh, activity. The question, I mean, cooperation, alliances. My question is, what are the prospects? What needs to be overcome? Why can't we do this? I am so happy that I am a moderator right now. <laughs> uh, um, <clears throat> the National Defense Strategy emphasizes the importance of partnerships and alliances. As General Nakasone says, the United States has friends. Other countries have clients. The United States Yes, we are very focused on the security relationship with the North Atlantic, but we also have treaty commitments and defense agreements, mutual defense agreements, with Asia Pacific allies, which are very robust. The United States has significant military presence in countries in Asia. We are a Pacific nation, which as someone who grew up on the Pacific coast, I'm very aware of, and that's not even the end of where the United States is in the Pacific. Um, I think that we have to be wary of a narrative that the Chinese are trying to spread, that um, Asia should only be for Asians. And sitting here as a representative of the United States, the United States is an Asian Pacific nation. Um, and so as we build those relationships, as we continue that, I think the cooperation is quite strong. 
our, our alliances are quite strong. Um, we need to build on that. We have partnerships around the world, and it is a network of partnerships that we bring to bear, and we work with people depending on their interest and depending on their maturity. It does not require a monolithic, bipolar network confrontation. Um, we will work with countries as they come. I think we have uh, alliances in the Asia-Pacific region uh, which are strong, uh, which uh, work uh, on a daily basis to uh, deter uh, malicious activities uh, or activities that will challenge the existing international uh, order uh, and ultimately conflict. Uh, uh, the, the United States uh, has the seventh fleet, four deployed in Japan. Uh, Japan uh, Okina in Okinawa hosts the, one of the three uh, Marine Expeditionary Forces uh, of the United States uh, Marine Corps. Uh, the Naval Academy cadets are uh, nodding. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have 55,000 uh, US uh, troops stationed in Japan. Uh, uh, there's also a strong alliance uh, Japan with the US and, and Korea as well, and Australia as well. And on top of that, I'm not foreseeing a new uh, military alliance uh, to, be, uh, to be forged, but we have uh, various layers of uh, international uh, fora uh, that we cooperate with. Uh, we cooperate with ASEAN. There's also the East Asian Summit, which includes uh, ASEAN plus uh, US uh, and also um, Australia, New Zealand, India. Uh, we also have the, the Quad is something that we had created. Uh, this was something that we had advocated for. Uh, and and now, because of, well, not just because of Ukraine, but we are forging closer ties uh, with NATO. Um, our foreign minister attended uh, NATO's foreign minister's meeting for the first time uh, in April. Um, we have uh, close ties uh, in cyber. We have, we have the cyber staff talks with NATO. Uh, we attend, as an observer, the formal exercise. We also attend the locked shields here at the center. We have an official from the Ministry of Defense. Uh, in the center uh, this past uh, continuously. Um, and I think what I'd like to say is, all, amongst all the military alliances, the United States is at the center uh, with, the, with the strongest military in the world. I mean, I, there is no question about that. Uh, and they, with the alliance that we forged in this part of the world, it's NATO, in our part of the world, it's bilateral uh, treaties. But the, the, this is extremely strong and sound, and I think up until now have deterred a really serious uh, malicious or military activity to, be, to take place. Can, can Let me I... just clarify my question. If you discover a new APT, how do we know about it? How is it that all of, I mean, because the APT, or advanced persistent threat that you discover, brand new, it can attack to us just as much as you, but you have discovered it. How do we find out about it? What are the structures the, that currently exist by which we automatically, you know, with the milliseconds that it takes to get from Tokyo to Tallinn, find out that, oh, we discovered this new bad guy. That's all. I mean, this is what, that, we don't have the institutional arrangements for that right now. Uh, I think that as we look at public-private partnerships, the persistence requirements for an APT means that they would be very clearly visible, not only to our governments, but to private sector actors. The question then becomes the attribution and the intent behind the APT. That an APT is out there and that it is uh, establishing presence on a network is a different question on whether, than whether they are disrupting the network. And the disruptions rising to a particular level announce themselves. Um, I, I don't think that we have a challenge in terms of the arrival of a new APT and our inability to talk about that. Law enforcement cooperation, national security and intelligence cooperation, private sector cooperation. Um, APTs are known by many names, by many different actors, and we see them on the networks all the time. So I think that, that there's not necessarily a need for an institutional environment, you know, we don't need sort of an ICANN for APTs to name them and like assign them names so that everybody calls them the same thing. I think we are doing okay. Uh, we are doing is. okay, I think, in terms of <laughs> swiftly exchanging information uh, on those uh, threats that, that we, 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 catch, we capture. We don't, we don't hog the information, <laughs> we, we, we spread it around to make sure that everyone is aware. As you had 
mentioned that it, it's instant, so it needs to be shared instantly. In the same way we do with cyber vulnerabilities, right? I mean, we declare them um, internationally. We've got the Cyber Threat Alliance, multinational organisations in the private domain. It would be harder to keep it quiet than it would be to share. Um, so again, I don't think it's a matter of um, setting up special alliances to do that. I think we're happy to share that, the, the fact of and, and, and some of the behaviours. And I would just like to say this multi-stakeholder structure stands in stark contrast to the structure that China has tried to establish, which requires uh, disclosure of these vulnerabilities to the government first mm -hmm. for their determination on how that would go. I don't think that that is the kind of thing that we want in a, in a multi-stakeholder, free and open society. Mm -hmm. We do not require that the governments are the first to know and then decide whether or not the public and the industry should know. It is something we all know and share at the same time. Mm, absolutely, and of course, that was exactly the case of the Log4J, right? There was an Alibaba employee who who um, announced it and talked to Apache about it. And I hope uh, it's okay. And then I hope so too, right? But the you know China, um, uh, I think, ended up sanctioning Alibaba Cloud and cancelled their um, contract with them for six months, and then said that I will reassess later uh, when you've addressed this. So you know we're not interested in applying that kind of pressure. We know that they're going to be hiding the kinds of vulnerabilities that they find, um, but you know that's a stark contrast to how the rest of the world intends to continue operating. This this information sharing uh, reminded me of one one uh, talk of, of a colleague a couple of years ago. Um, and that was a European colleague who was saying that uh, it, it's really useful to have some contacts with uh, with uh, Asian countries. Uh, I mean. First, uh, with Australia, with Japan, with Singapore, because they wake up earlier. They know <laughs> about different attacks earlier. <laughs> but we have a time for a last uh, quick question, and, and we have their hand up. And please. Hi. Yes. Oh. oh, sorry. That's uh... Hi. With all due my highly respect, I am from Taiwan. Um, maybe the. One of the representatives from Indo-Pacific area. And um, let me quickly answer the questions in uh, for the uh, the previous one. We look at the APTs not only for their TTPS but also for their malware patterns. There are always the signature was some signal that hidden in those malware, and uh, also like we chase the. Uh, uh, um, the hacking group from mainland China, we can understand that most of they use a social engineer as a first as a stepping point, and they also the zero day to do the attack in the following. But we can discuss that later. My question is for um, uh, those uh, uh, panels on the stage is as uh, the conference discussed lots of about the relationship between the Russia and the Ukraine. This is the, probably the very first session bring up the implication interaction in the Asia and the Indo-Pacific area. Um, I don't really mean Taiwan and China, I just say it's a, uh, broadly speaking the Indo-Pacific area. What do you think the frontline countries no matter in the geographic term or the cyber term to do, to work on and to keep moving to shape the environment and to be more sustainable for the threat <coughs> in the future. And how can those countries do align with the Europe or NATO interests strategically or techni not technically? Um, or what can we help? What can Taiwan do? What can Taiwan help? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I really appreciate the question. I think Taiwan, like Ukraine, is at the front line of cyber, uh, malicious cyber activity. And so they are very much a frontline state. And so Taiwan, like Ukraine, has, very, uh, has a lot of experience with how that malicious actor is trying to access and potentially disrupt their networks. And so there's much that we can all learn from their experience uh, in this regard. Um, lessons for frontline countries from Ukraine, I think, include understanding how Ukraine was able to maintain its resilience, its ability to communicate with the outside world, and its ability to continue to command and control its forces while under the most rigorous strain that we have ever seen in the cyber domain from outside forces. 
lessons learned from Ukraine in terms of how they reacted to the disruption of their satellite communications, how they are able to become resilient and have um, multiple ways of you know falling back and degrading as things are uh, disrupted. The number of uh, the cooperation between the ISPs in Ukraine is an example of how they can to move to migrate quickly when disruption occurs. Their migration to the cloud during the conflict is another example of things that frontline nations can think about. How do you develop resilient architecture that will help you withstand disruption in the cyber domain? And I think that there are many countries that could learn a lot about having resilient architecture from what has happened uh, in Ukraine. And we look forward to being able to continue to engage with them on their lessons learned, perhaps when they have a little more time. I think this uh, this is a good good moment uh, and good thoughts actually to uh, to to end this conversation. Um, and I'm really sorry for those who still had questions but uh, did not have the time. Um, I, I thought it was a fascinating uh, and uh, and thank you so much for being here and uh, and uh, uh, let's thank the panel, please. <laughs>